for us a skirt? Hey, I got dragged to poetry readings, too. That doesn't make me Carl Sandburg. Come on, Leo, you know me. I'm non-political. Republicans, Democrats, communists, they all look alike to me. Peter, he's legal counsel for the studio. I strongly advise you to watch what you say. Right? Apolitical screenwriter in 1950s Hollywood. That's that's uh, that's normal, right? I, I don't... <sighs> The maj- I, don't, I don't know. We were going to get like, into that one. This is like, this is a tough cold open because the Majestic is such a can of worms that I don't like the moment we open it is going to be this disastrous conversation. I can tell. Ooh, and Brian, I, think I don't even know what your take on the movie is, but I know it's going to be a disaster. <laughs> uh, yeah. Brian, welcome back. We're a new season of uh, Film Trace. Uh, Brian from Deep Focus Review. Brian, why don't you say hello and tell us what you're all about? What's been going on with you? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me back. I appreciate uh, the invite. Um, yeah, I write for Deep Focus Review. Um, I have a Patreon that I, you know, get paid for through that. I uh, write on Rotten Tomatoes occasionally, or uh, post my reviews on Rotten Tomatoes rather. Um, yeah, things th- things are great. Any uh, recent because you you get to see basically everything that's new that's coming out, right? Uh, everything um, that I want to see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any recent favorites, any recent duds that, uh, you want to highlight? Uh, well, no hard feelings just opened this weekend. I kind of didn't like that. Um, Ooh, I, don't, I have uh, such high hopes for that. I thought it was going to save comedies, but I'm probably wrong. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It, it just wasn't <laughs> like, I wasn't scandalized and I wanted to be, um, yeah, okay, I gotcha. yeah. I just enough. Say, the audience really liked it. I, I, I will say like. The okay. audience was laughing a lot, and I just maybe I'm just an old cynic or something, but I just didn't find it funny. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I did like Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Oh, oh scandalous! Uh, I heard yeah. the early critical stuff was not great, but you liked it. I did, yeah. And I, you know, I, I also liked Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, so there's that's who I am. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm just taking the movie for what it is, and I and I I could have gone a negative route and said that this doesn't feel like an Indiana Jones movie and it doesn't feel like a Spielberg movie, but it's not a Spielberg movie. And right. it's a, uh, it's a movie that takes place, you know, 40 years after more than 40 years after the, after the originals. So it's not going to feel the same. Um, I just accepted it for what it was. And I mean, by the end I was, I was That's in fun, tears. Right? Like I was, Oh really? It was very emotional. emotional. Yeah. Very surprising. Interesting. So, because yeah. you know it's the last time you're going to see Harrison Ford right, absolutely. in this role. That's absolutely. Mm-hmm. You can oh, tell he said that last time, though. But you, he did. we know this time. Did he, t- did he say yeah. that last time? I don't remember that. Did he really? I, I just made that up. Hey. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we, everybody kind of assumed. I think that was like a – that was insinuated in terms of like – I can't believe they're bringing him back. This was like the beginning of the whole like reboot craze of the yeah. 2010s, right? Uh, so I feel yeah, like yeah. I feel like that was yeah. Just like I mean I don't think anybody expected him to come back as Han Solo or sure. uh, but the, the, the de-aging got so much better that it made more sense, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's de-aging in this movie too and I I, did, yeah. I didn't like those parts really at all. Um but it's a, it's a tough technology. It um yeah. sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't right. okay what are we talking about today this is going to be our second episode of i don't think we do like season counts anymore do we we're on no. cycle six whatever that means to y'all oh so you're counting i'm not it's not our spreadsheet <laughs> it's a c6 cycle six <laughs> oh, uh, so this is nice. it's a it's i guess it's gonna be the second episode of our uh season six whatever cycle uh this is um the theme this uh season is set in the 1950s uh, this is kind of a joint kind of idea that we had. Mm-hmm. I don't know, Chris, can you explain it? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, sometimes we have like a certain niche genre or style or something that um, we just are itching to talk about. And so we look for a new release that uh, kind of encompasses that to center it around. And this time we just basically want really wanted to start with asteroid city and work backward from there so so we were so i i but i actually i i'm really happy about uh the oh, selection yeah. of films we have to talk about uh because it turns out that setting your movie in the 50s um can just like like especially like the differences between these two movies specifically like in the 2000s you had like two huge at least movies with huge stars and um from like 
semi-notable directors, one of which that is uh, Todd Haynes, we'll talk about Far From Heaven, um, aping the style of Douglas Sirk. And then we have Frank Darabont from The Majestic aping the style of Frank Capra, uh, which is, you know, you, you we see this a lot in modern movie making and it'll be interesting to watch as we get closer to the 50s and we'll actually uh, end the season by talking about rebel without a cause um mm-hmm. how uh how much it's changed and kind of cyclically like w- worked its way into this weird kind of um semi-ironic semi-sincere uh kind of recreation of the past of essentially what many people consider to be like a golden age of hollywood filmmaking yeah i mean it's also uh, i did not mean for these two movies to be this well matched it was kind of a random selection i was like oh the majestic i sort of remember that (laughs) like let's well let's do that one yeah um have you guys let's start out i mean a little bit maybe brian you can start out here like what's your history Let's just talk about both of the films. Like, what's your history with Far From Heaven? Did you see when it came out? Uh, and the same with Majestic. Yeah, Far From Heaven was maybe the first Todd Haynes film I had seen when it came out. Mm. Um, and I enjoyed it. Uh, although I have a longer history with Douglas Sirk. Um, so mm. I, it was a little, I was a little dismissive toward it because it was just, oh, that's all that heaven allows and a, and a dash of yeah. um, imitation of life. Okay, great. Um, and yes, it's, you know, dealing with a lot of the same themes and being more inclusive about those themes. But um, I think that ironic aspect that Chris alluded to with this um, maybe turned me off a little bit to it. Uh, I've since grown on the movie and watched it several times since it's come out. Um and then the majestic, yeah, I saw that when it came out, and everybody hated it. And I was like, yeah, "This is actually pretty good. I, I enjoy this movie. I don't think it's a masterpiece or anything, but um, I think there's a there's more good to it and more ideas behind it. Um, that I, I don't know. I think there's a one. There's this intertextuality with with the the majestic that I really love. Uh, that he's that Darabont is bringing in kind of all these references to other movies. And we can talk more about that later, but I also just love how it kind of sheds more light on Frank Darabont's career. Um, yeah. And his attitude toward like small town America. Um, and so for that aspect, I, I actually kind of enjoy it. Yeah. It was kind of, I remember that the majestic coming out, you know, Jim Carrey's got the $20 million paycheck and the thing kind of just <laughs> DOA, like was yeah. it December 2001, got very heavy uh, season for holiday films and awards films and just got completely lost in the shuffle. I had actually, for me, uh, this is the first time I've seen it all the way through. I've seen parts mm-hmm. of it before, but never had any interest and just sort of, okay, now I can see it for the first time. Also, Far From Heaven, had never seen it before. Wow. In fact, I don't think I've seen a Todd Haynes film. Like this what? is the first one I've seen. Yeah. Wow. You haven't seen Carol? Nope. Parts of it haven't seen the whole way through. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have a very different perspective probably than you all. Uh, what about yeah. you, Chris? Yeah. So, um, uh, Carol was actually my first Todd. No, no, Vel- uh, no. Philip Goldman. I think Velvet Goldman actually was first. Um, because yeah. yeah, I had seen uh, uh, Carol in theaters and. Um, I remember knowing it at that point that it was the Velvet Goldmine guy. Um, but uh, I didn't see Far From Heaven until uh, like five years ago, about probably yeah. not too long after I saw Carol. And um, I was, I got, I got curious uh, about Todd Haynes. I had seen um, I'm Not There, uh, the um, Bob Dylan movie, um, yeah. and wasn't like a huge fan of it, but was, I was kind of electrified just by like the concept of it. It was, you know, the, the mid to late 2000s. So, that, you know, there was, uh, we had started seeing like kind of that more, kind of like what Brian was mentioning with like the Majestic is like, uh, I don't, I don't really like the movie, but I, I, can watch it in 2023 and be very appreciative of the fact that that was a wide release film like set sure. in the 50s yeah. and about like the hollywood blacklist and like you wouldn't that would never <laughs> like that would never be no. as widely released today um, yeah. even if e- even if they didn't you know know that it would be box office poison um but anyways with todd haynes uh the thing that actually like kind of solidified um my kind of admiration for him was actually dark waters the uh oh, yeah. the tried and true kind of uh legal 
a biopic thriller with uh, Mark Ruffalo. Um, about, oh yes, about yeah. the, the, it was kind of like Michael Clayton minus ex- the explosions. Um, <laughs> for, <laughs> Any horses and, or anything? No. Yeah, and, and no, yeah, no, no enigmatic horses either. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I was just really struck by that movie because um, it had it. It kind of made me see that Haynes was really interested in the the craft of cinema and like trying to work within certain constraints. And so then I actually watched Far From Heaven again after I liked Dark Waters so much and kind of saw it for in a different perspective where I was like, oh, now yeah. I'm kind of understanding like what this guy's deal is. And then I started reading about like his interviews uh about Far From Heaven at the time and his own like obsession with Cirque and how they recreated it. And I, and kind of like Brian mentioning about the, the, the ironic aspect, I think that would kind of like a touch turned me off. Like I had, um, I don't think I've seen either Imitation of Life or uh, what's the other one you mentioned, Brian, the, the All that Heaven Allows, probably. All that Heaven Allows, but I had seen uh, Written on the Wind. And, okay. uh, and so like, at kind of the same time, the first viewing in like 2017 or whatever, I was like, oh yeah, this is this is interesting, but why would you do that? And then I saw Dark Waters, and then I saw Far, Far From Heaven again, and then I rewatched it again, of course, for this recording. So um, all three viewings, I think what really just like solidifies my love for this film is how you can watch it in such different respects. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah as its own thing without any Cirque reference. And he he talks about that um, in the press circuit for the movie back when it came out. He's like, he wanted it to be able to stand on its own for, you know, film geeks that are also obsessed with Cirque like he was, as well as like first timers, like just coming into the world of the old fashioned melodrama. And I do, I do. I think after watching it a few times, I think it works both ways really well. And um it's one of those like rare movies that is just like about domestic life that is just inherently rewatchable. Um, yeah. And I think that's uh, unusual and special. And so, yeah, I think that um, I, 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 I'm curious to get in it with, with you, Dan, uh, what, <laughs> what is it about far from heaven? You text me out of nowhere and just say the majestic better than far from heaven question mark. And, <laughs> and it was like, thanks for ruining my day, Dan. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, so I so mean, Dan, no, go ahead, Brian. Dan, have you seen all that heaven allows? No, I've seen clips and stuff, but I've never oh, seen the whole okay. way through. Yeah. Okay. I think that's the, the, the big thing for me is that without the Cirque grounding, Hmm. It's kind of tough. So maybe we should, I mean, Brian, you seem to like Douglas Sirk a lot. Maybe you can kind of give us like maybe the the cliff notes of what he was all about. Sure. Yeah. So at least in his fifties melodramas. um, So just to take a step back, like as I'm watching far far from heaven, it's almost like watching Gus Van Zandt's like psycho remake (laughs) Um, because it's so close to all that heaven allows down to um, the choice of colors, the, you know, just the expressive um, lighting, like, you know, just these blue hues at night. And uh, I mean, it's just, everything is borrowed right from all that heaven allows. Uh, Even the story structure is just about kind of a housewife who is bored, gets in a relationship with her gardener and her gardener is um, kind of poo pooed by the, you know, the, the neighborhood folk who are, you know, want her to just conform and everything. Um, the only difference is that there's, you know, a, a queer theme and a, and a, uh, a black theme in this film. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, and so uh, the conversation between those two movies, not only those two, but also um, fast, fast benders, Ali fear eats the soul is so close that uh, I'm like, my mind is, I, I can't, see that film outside of that context outside of those yeah. contexts so for you two i i don't even know like i can't even imagine i'm so interested in what you're seeing when you see this movie um so then to answer your question dan yeah Cirque is very much you know talking about n- normality in 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 uh what normality is in, in these kind of suburban cultures and then breaking uh breaking from that and showing people who break from that and kind of using lots of color, vivid colors. And, um, he's really conforming to the idea of what a, what a melodrama is. So the whole idea of a melodrama is like, you know, you're building this crescendo. It's like a musical term. Um, Mm -hmm. 
and you're you're building this height and and uh, you reach these heights and you just keep going higher and higher. So emotions are very um, pointed and big, and it seems almost silly today. It's like the it's like the source of a, what a soap opera. Um, yeah, of course. Was yeah. you know I think a lot of soap operas watched Cirque melodramas and were like, oh, we could do that you know every week or every day. Um, <laughs> And that's kind of what you're watching. And so you can see some of that definitely in Far From Heaven where the dialogue is very pointed and and Yeah. Um it, yeah, it, I mean, it's like the like Dennis Quaid's sort of I mean it's not even like I don't want to say Oscar real, but that's not what it is. <laughs> right? It's like the, the the reveals and sort of when he's drunk and tries to kiss her and can't and says oh maybe you can have sex with this other guy like it uh and then hits her um so i mean obviously so over the top it's so such an artifice and it's so you know that's the point of it right the point of it is to sort of ape this style to some degree The, the the big massive question around far from heaven is if cirque was already being ironic in what he was doing yeah and then Haynes is coming in and sort of imitating that ironic style. What it, it seems like such a two thousands movie to me, where it's like yeah. Cirque yeah. is more in like in a postmodern type situation, where he's using sort of the studio artifice and Hollywood to comment on things. And Haynes kind of doing the same thing, but it's so I don't know. It just um, and especially without seeing Cirque's films, I've only just sort of seen interviews with him and some clips. Um, I don't necessarily have the critical grounding to dive into it that much, but to me, as someone who didn't have that context going into this movie, wow, does it feel it, it, at first it's very interesting because obviously everything in this is ironic to some degree. Right. Um, but then I was sort of left with, okay, like, but why? And sort of what, what is Haynes trying to get out of these characters and the story that needed this sort of imitation of an artifice and why, you know, that's the thing that I keep as I watched it and I've rewatched it again in the second time is way better actually. Cause then you yeah. have like, I have more of this context that, you know, looking up circuit and all that kind of stuff, but still there's this sort of like, um, I remember my, my thesis advisor in college was like, uh, I had this thesis idea. He's like, this just seems like an, an academic exercise. Is what he told me. <laughs> sure. And I was sort of like, is this the equivalent of that in film? Where is there, or is there, am I, is there something else going on here? There's something deeper. Is he, is he uprooting something deeper in Cirque's work and how it could be viewed today? What do you guys think? What, what stood out to me in watching it for a third time um in particular was the fact that like, because I had I, in between the second and third viewings um, started understanding like Haynes's uh, shtick. And then, um, so then researching, and that's when I saw Written on the Wind, um, I think All That Heaven Allows wasn't available on streaming at the time. And I believe it's still not. I think I just looked it up the other day and it's like, it's it, 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 it comes to mind that like far from, it's interesting that like now we're in a world where it is, unless you're going to like borrow it from the library or something, it's way easier to find far from heaven than it is the film that it cribs from so heavily. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that when I have like this kind of gut reaction upon multiple watches, it, it, the thing that hits me the most, and I, and we've said it without actually like commenting on it is that while Cirque was, very much like working within the confines of uh, 50s American norms. Um, And so a lot of like his commentary on social injustice and prejudice was um, subtext, had to be subtext. Um, Haynes brings it to the forefront. And then you've got this kind of conflicting style that is distant and like trying to like replicate a certain feeling. I don't know. I, I, come with it with like you were saying dan like with it it begs more watches because then you're trying to like reconcile one aspect with another um there's a really good quote from um a sight and sound interview that haynes did um that i think kind of 
encapsulate what I'm trying to explain, then I think he does it a lot better. He said, uh, when we think about distance, we think about cutting off of emotion. And it's not that. It's a distance that brings with it a greater emotional reservoir of feeling. I think there's something really uh, telling about that like huge Elmer Bernstein music swell happening yeah. while we're actually getting like a, a authentic three dimensional black character speaking truths on screen like that that uh kind of bifurcated like emotion like makes me is is what makes cinema so enjoyable often most of the time because then I'm not I'm not just hearing one story i'm hearing two at the same time and hearing that tension between them while also like i said my initial watch knowing basically nothing about douglas sirk um initially uh i was just i was just captivated by the storyline about like this very like kind of straightforward almost like mad men-esque esque like uh exploration of domesticity and uh um women's point of view and uh um, homophobia and internalized hom- homophobia and all that. I think it was fascinating enough. And then it just like gets richer upon each subsequent viewing. Though my opinion might totally change once I finally, if I ever get my hands on a DVD of for All That Heaven Allows. Well, yeah. there's a great Criterion disc if you ever uh, just want to fight the ball and buy it. Yeah, I think I might. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's funny too. Like the way that Haynes talks about this movie in interviews and there's a great group of clips um, from like a 20th anniversary. Uh, they did it like I think it was Pride last year in Los Angeles. They did a 20th anniversary of this movie and had everybody back. Um, and the way he talks about it and the way he views it, it's like the dude is clearly like an intellectual like he studied art and semiotics at NYU. Like he's not like <laughs> this is not someone who's sort of like tiptoeing like uh, tiptoeing into film without some huge sort of philosophical viewpoint of how he's doing it. And it's sort of like I, I think, it, which is even more mind blowing to me that this thing got released when it did mm-hmm. with like the backing that it did. Now it wasn't, and they 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 talk about this in these interviews and stuff. It was not a movie that had a huge budget. You know, everything that they did essentially to recreate Cirque style was not, almost none of it was digital. Yeah. Right. And so the tight schedule, I think they're shooting right after 9-11. It, it, was, it was not an easy shoot from what it, it sounds like, but it sounded like everybody was on board with what they were doing. And it ended up, there, there's the one thing you cannot fault about this film is it, it just looks phenomenal. Yeah. It looks beautiful. Absolutely. And the the set, the production design, the set design is just really second to none. Um, but I do, I do go back to that artifice and the way that he even talks about it, where there's this deep love of Cirque's work. He wants to imitate it, but then he also does this sort of what I would call like a, an art school. Someone who studies semiotics or literary theory, they do this thing where it's sort of like, well, the artifice, the, the truth is in the artifice. Yeah. Right. He kind of used that uses that as an excuse. He says something like, where is it? All forms of film language are a choice. None of it is truth. Uh, with this film, we point out at the start that we're all aware of this. We're not using today's conventions to portray what's real. What's real is our emotions when we're in the theater, which is kind of what you're alluding to, Chris, I think. Right. Yes. Um, yes. He's he's creating something in that um, sort of vacuum tube that is a, a movie theater that you can create those swells, you can create beautiful color, uh, you can conjure these emotions, and that's something in and of itself. I guess the bigger question that I have, and Brian, I'm going to point this back to you, is he doing something different or more than Cirque was doing back in the day? I don't think so. I think what I think Cirque had the, the – the way I think about this movie is sort of like – the movie Cat People next to the remake of Cat People mm. or Cape Fear next to the remake of Cape Fear. Sure. Where working in the studio system, Cirque couldn't come out and say what he needed to say um, yeah, yeah. for the, all the reasons that you, you pointed out before. Um, but he has to use symbols. And so there are things like um, there's this flower called the Anthurium or uh, – Mm, might yeah. be called lace leaf, where it's like, you know, it kind of looks like a vagina, it kind of looks like a penis. And yeah. he puts that all over this very sexualized character, um, using these big, bold images of like a, a um, oil, of an oil um, t- 
tower, which is a very phallic image. Um, so he has to do all these things that are very subtle. And Haynes doesn't have to do that. Uh, Haynes can come out and talk about what he needs to talk about. And he's not limited at all. And they can have open conversations about the specific things that, you know, there are prejudices against. Um, yeah. And so I feel like his his exercise, while effective and the colors are – you know, achieve the, uh, achieve the attended, intended emotion. I don't feel like he's challenged in the same way that Cirque was and that mm-hmm. Cirque used his, you know, just the cinematic apparatus to overcome and convey those emotions. So it feels a little to me hollow. Um, yeah. That said, I, I mean, I, I come down in the movie on for all those reasons, just because it's uh, so obviously alluding to all these things in Cirque's, in Cirque's uh, movie, but then again, in the last third of the movie, I'm totally swept up in the emotions, even though (laughs) I I I think the first third is kind of hard to get through just as they're establishing, you know, these characters and the kind of cookie cutter world that, that that she lives in. And it's all about facades and everything. Um, It's a little, it's a little cloying to me. Um, Yeah. And I suppose that's the point, but um at the same time, it's just so it's so steeped in like a 1950s cinematic representation of what that era is like that um, it, it doesn't feel real and it only feels real by the end. And maybe that's a good yeah. thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. But um, that, that's where I'm at with it. <laughs> well, I think I, it's like oh, go ahead, Chris. I, I was just going to add that like the thing that I find value in, and it's, I guess this is just like the general uh, common argument about like modern art, right. Is the, it's the whole, like, I feel like it's a pretty uh, ubiquitous, like editorial cartoon where it's, you know, two people at an art museum and one's looking at a intricately painted uh, realistic portrait. And the other one's looking at like, uh, you know, a, a Rothko or something. And, mm-hmm. You know, it's like uh, my my kid could do that, but your kid didn't do that. And like, it, it it what fascinates me and impresses me, and also I think kind of adds to the emotion for me is the fact that I he's not just replicating history on screen with such precise detail. It's also then like allowing itself to be a bridge, like an actual like. Uh, connection to the past like I don't know if if I would have ever even as like I I consider myself a a, like (laughs) like kind of desperately into movies and yet like I don't know if I would have ever seen a Cirque movie if I hadn't seen this one first as sad as that may be that's a really good I've never heard of him before for this movie really really yeah I I don't have a background in film or like that but that's one of those things it's like a gateway sort of to other filmmakers and what they've done and I just also I find this movie I find the response to this movie so uh, nuts when it came out. It's like uh, like critics fawned over it. Like it's like the best thing they've ever seen. <laughs> Which I mean, is, is like mind like blowing to me. It's kind of catnip for like the for it's interesting to for hear that your set of people, Brian. Yeah, yeah, because like if you like this could easily kind of like that whole the question that is obliquely asked by Dennis Haysbert's character in the movie about, or maybe it's uh, Julianne Moore's character asks of him, like, do we ever see past the surface? Right. Um, and I think like on the surface, it's just like complete catnip for anybody that grew up watching fifties Hollywood movies. And yet there's like this whole conversation to be had underneath the surface. And uh, it either, it either goes deep for you or it doesn't. And I can, I can, I mean, it's interesting to hear our three different perspectives because, like, I'm mostly unfamiliar and adore it. Uh, Brian's very familiar and likes it, but has reservations. And Dan, you have zero uh, background and more reservations. Like, it's it's just wild that a movie that essentially is, yeah, I think in some respects a facsimile of another movie um, can draw out that kind of disparate reaction from people. I also think we, it's uh, go, go ahead, ahead. Brian. Um, uh, is it really saying anything that's, it, it, it seems to me 
part of this early 2000s era mm. movie that that confronts racism or or you know queer subjects that okay we've pointed it out and and now you're all aware right um, uh, and it, it just doesn't seem to be saying anything that, that that's, that's super deep to me. Um, and, and I don't know, I, I just feel like movies today, at least, and it's maybe not a fair comparison, but they're dealing with these topics in, in more than a surface level way. And I feel like if you penetrate the surface, this of the narrative and, and remove all the style, it's really just a kind of a commonplace story that that would have you know been told almost the same way in the 1950s um aside from maybe a few details here and there but I, i'm not seeing a, a lot of depth hmm. but uh, then haynes would be like well that's kind of the point right there is no depth in anything <laughs> i can create these he basically you think about his like what the superstar movie with karen carpenter thing where it was just like yeah the barbie doll thing he's like He's all about creating cutout dolls and like creating characters and making you feel emotions for these art- artificial things. Like he loves that whole concept of doing that. Yeah. No one studies semiotics unless they love stuff like that. Right. Like, <laughs> so I think I, now I'm defending him. Now you guys right, yeah. have made me defend him. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that's the thing that I felt more than anything is that I wanted to engage with the context of this movie. Like, I love, this is why we do the show, right? We go back, we look, how did this come to be? And with this one, it made me interested to go look at Cirque, but now I want to watch Cirque's movies. I don't want to watch Far From Heaven again. Right. You know, and I want to go back and watch and see, like, what that was all about. Because I love the melodrama stuff. I love, you know, noir's kind of an offshoot of that. Um, All of the interesting things that you could do within the medium of film while saying one thing and meaning another and then meaning a third thing and then a fourth thing, there's so much that the medium allows that sort of uh, layer textuality to it. And like, yeah, Far From Heaven is aping that act of intertextuality. But again, like where's the there's tension, I think, in like those other movies, like a Cirque movie, like there's a lot of tension. You can feel it. I didn't feel any tension in this movie at all. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it kind of just felt like, oh, yeah, OK, like he's pointing out that these old movies we're saying one thing and meaning another. Here's the other thing that they meant. Okay. You know, like it doesn't, I don't know. There's just something I, I go back to. It does kind of feel a little bit like uh, an exercise, an academic exercise to me, a beautiful one and a lovely film to watch and enjoy. Cause it's such a, a work of art, but something I think for me personally is just lacking a bit. Now onto the majestic is completely different. <laughs> I can't even say that with a straight face. <laughs> um, let's shift over to the majestic really quick. Cause I think there's a lot to talk about in between these two movies. Sure. Right. Absolutely. The majestic, I did not see when it came out. Um, I just felt like, Hey, we're doing set in the 1950s. This, this thing just popped into my med- head immediately. Frick Darabond, you know, he's had a really strange career over the last 20 years. Um, really high highs in the nineties. Um, and then some in the, you know, walking dead, he started that show, but then it got fired. Um, and this movie was, um, supposed to be a massive, massive film. Um, it was supposed to be one of the bigger films for Warner brothers that year. And it, and it really crashed and burned. So, I mean, how do you want to start out with this? I, um, do we like his work in general? I kind of, I'm, I go back and forth on him. Like, do you guys like Shawshank Redemption? Uh, yes, I think it's a fine movie. I don't think it's like you know the best movie ever made. Like a lot of people do, uh, I tend to prefer his. Um, I, like the Mist is one of my probably favorite horror movies of all time. Oh, uh, so good, uh, so good. A black, the black and white version, especially. Yes, um, it's, oh. it's, it's it's a masterpiece. Um, yeah, I really like the Green Mile, um, but I have you know reservations about that. And mostly just because of Stephen King and his his use of the you know quote magical Negro, um, yeah. But I tend to like Frank Darabont, and whenever his name is attached to um, specifically the horror genre, I'm interested. Uh, the, he co-wrote The Blob, which is a right. fascinating movie. Um, yes, great. And movie. Uh, the third A Nightmare on Elm Street movie, which is I think the best one. Um, so he, I tend to like what he does. Um, this is definitely toward the bottom of of my list of his movies, but I, I do enjoy it, um, and I think it's I think it's more interesting than than a lot of people give it credit for. 
Um, I yeah. So I kind of alluded to this earlier, but the the biggest kind of frustration that I have with this movie, and I so I never saw it. I had seen the entirety of it, but in out of order because I worked at a movie theater in 2001 when it came out. Oh yeah, <laughs> and so Chris, Chris Point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's. Dan's loving nickname for the movie theater from our hometown. Um, <laughs> and and so like I was very much caught up in like watching chunks of it when I was supposed to be, you know, cleaning a different auditorium. Um, and uh, especially because like I, I kind of got sucked in at around that age, you know, uh, senior year of high school of like the magic of movies and like yeah. being just like, hypnotized by like here i am working in a movie theater which was like always i had always wanted it to be my first job and then i am captivated you know in these moments between cleaning theaters of about this movie about a movie theater and so it hit me on a really kind of um special level back then but i had kind of and i kept meaning to like actually go and properly sit down and watch it but also like there would be times where at, you know, 17 or, you know, 16, whatever age I was back then, um, trying to like also like catch different moments of it out of order where I was like, actually, this movie's kind of boring. And, <laughs> and so like, I, I think that was part of the reason I never got around to actually properly watching it um, because like I was so entranced by these moments about the movie theater, but then it was actually about like small town life in the fifties and uh, the red scare and all that. And uh, none of that stuff really interested me <laughs> until college. Um, yeah. So then when I finally sat down to like give it an honest what single sitting watch for this episode, I was like, I it it I think it is the Frank Darabont of it all that that annoys me the most about it. Um, I <laughs> I don't like any of his movies. Uh, I I and think you've the seen mist, the mist and you, you, I, I the mist is my favorite of his. If for yeah, no other so reason fun. than it's, so its ending, um, yeah, one of the best endings ever. Yeah, no but but I also just like I don't know. He's got this corral of actors that. Uh, you know pop up in all of his movies and just the he's got just like this such kind of you know zemeckis whimsy to him that <laughs> i just it never hits right for me it always feels a little too broad and too uh you know not there's not like a singular voice there it feels messy it feels like he's just like trying to it seems like he's accidentally doing what haynes is doing on purpose and yeah, I, I was going to bring that up because, like, how, what is the role of uh, role of artifice here in imitation here? Right, I it's, it's just it's so on the nose constantly. Right, but like he, I don't think Frank Darabont has. I don't get the sort of self awareness that Haynes clearly has from what he's doing. Um, yes, it's so on the nose all the time. You'd think that he would. But what I find fascinating about it, maybe it's the fact that Cirque was already doing an ironic take in melodrama, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas Camper, Capra wasn't. It was a little bit more straightforward. These are both examples of homage, right? And it's like, is it just because the target of that is different? Um, because Capra was a little bit more, you know, Americana, kind of corny, sentimental, uh, sentimental, like, uh what do you guys think i mean is there did did frank darman know what he was doing here <laughs> I, I i think he did and i think i think characterizing capra as sentimental is maybe a, a little I, I feel like if you look at an individual film by by capra and, and yeah. really any one of them he's kind of acknowledging how the world sucks and yeah to to just mm -hmm. grit your teeth and bear it and and you know, uh, uh, support the American ideal or just, you know, the, the, the hope that things will get better, uh, no matter what. And I think Darabont really taps into that in this, yeah. um, uh, you know, he's, he's acknowledging that this, the world is corrupt and unfair and, 
politics suck and Hollywood business sucks and, you know, just everything kind of sucks, but we can, we can hope for more and we can, you know, escape in the movies and that's great. Uh, and I feel like that really aligns with something like it's a wonderful life or meet John Doe where yeah. they're exposing how the world is just an awful corrupt place, but Hey, we got our little town or we, you know, we fell in love or wouldn't it be nice if things were better? Let's stick to that. Um, and to your point about, you know, if Cirque was already ironic, uh, what's the point of irony in this? I think he's, I think, I think Darabont is less interested in doing an ironic take. Um, yeah. Despite some of the like references and kind of winks at the audience throughout. And he's more in, into like, recapturing that Capra spirit um, yeah. with earnestness. Uh, and that's kind of what I like about it. I think it, I think it works in that in, in mirroring what Capra was all about um, to your point about kind of the wings of the audience. Some of them work for me and some of them don't, um, you know, like the Raiders, of the Lark uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark golden idol kind of in the film within the film. Um, yeah, that's just like oh, that completely takes me out of the movie. But <laughs> Bruce he's Campbell, also, he's Bruce he's Campbell, also yeah. yeah, and Bruce Campbell, right? Um, <laughs> he's also doing things like putting the day that Earth stood still on the marquee. And, yes, and yeah. that's such an apt choice for this because it's, you know that's a film about how the world isn't all it's cracked up to be, and you know <laughs> we're all going to be annihilated if we don't if we don't <laughs> uh, uh, you know shape up. Um, so I, you know, there are some really smart things like that, or invasion of the body snatchers, you yeah. know, put, putting that on the marquee, um, and then there are just kind of dumb things. So he, it's like um, he he does he needs like a better editor or something. Although because <laughs> two this and a half hours, <laughs> two half hours, right? But uh, somewhere I read that the shorter version uh, of this, the the tests were worse. In the shorter mm. version, oh, they, the, the longer version did better in, in the the test screenings. It, um, I think, for me, the the thing that I enjoy about this movie is that um, Frank's not really. I wouldn't call him. Uh, Wait, is that like Darabont passive, or Capra? Uh, Darabont. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wouldn't call him cynical or pessimistic. Right, this movie, I think, has a very clear through line of optimism and mm-hmm. like mushy optimism, mm-hmm. like especially his like the politics of this movie are mm-hmm. absurd. <laughs> um, and like even in 2001, this is it must have been shot because it was released 2001 right after 9-11. So it was obviously shot before 9-11. The scenes of like uh, during the questioning in front of the the House committee and all of that, I mean, I almost like want to laugh. Like it's just yeah. it's so over the top. I get where he's coming from though, and it makes sense that he believes in those things. I mean, he he also has a very fascinating background. Like he was born in a refugee camp in France. His parents had fled Hungary during the revolution, and so he has a very specific background where his viewpoint of America. Uh, which is give you know he came here as a young man and a ton of opportunity he does sort of have um that sort of viewpoint of someone who has done so incredibly well in america and the society the i think the thing about it for me i wanted to love this movie until and i loved it until the ending yeah and the ending to me was just like <laughs> what is this uh it just did not at all line up to me with the first hour and a half of the movie it just ended so saccharine it's like it doesn't make any sense even like on a basic level like he goes back to the town they all accept him as like you know i don't know am i crazy in saying that does the end work for you guys or am i just like the odd man out uh i'll let brian have the final word uh but i i do have to pile on here a bit because i uh i mean i i don't know if i dislike the ending any more than I dislike other parts of the film. Um, the whole like jazz piano scene really just made me sick to my stomach and like, yeah, any scene okay. with, with the, the, you know, soul black character um, yeah. is really uh, unfortunate, but also very trope, 2001. Right. 
Yeah. But it's just, it, and I thought it was fascinating to watch that in conjunction with Far From Heaven, which is less than a year later. Um, yeah. Uh, and I, I just like, I also, th- I think one of the things um, I kind of alluded to, you know, uh, Darabont's, um kind of recurring cast, uh, all of which are like pleasantly familiar faces. And yet it's just like, so, it's so strange. This is like, like you mentioned, Dan, the 20 million paycheck for Jim Carrey. Yeah. And then your second build is Bob Balaban. And it's like, I, it's like this wide gulf. Like there's, it's, it's so, it, it's so in just this single character who doesn't remember who he is for a significant portion of it, that it really feels like that whole viewpoint is, is just, just pushed through, um, this, this narrative, this screenplay, um, from Michael Sloan, who, basically did nothing else uh yeah, he's a high like a high school friend of um yeah Frank and so it just ends up feeling so unmoored and like aimless and shambolic but i but it's still fascinating because of all the context around it and all the references within it um but i just yeah i think also maybe it's just like a nail in the coffin type thing when the um uh testifying in in front of the uh, House of Un-American Activities Committee um, becomes uh, this really um, kind of moment of optimism and hope that I think actually doesn't resonate with me the way that the triumphant like Jimmy Stewart moments in a Capra movie do. Yeah, and I and I don't I don't want to say it's as simple as this, but like Frank's no Frank. And Jim's no Jimmy. And I think it's as simple as that. <laughs> that's totally absurd. I think <laughs> that's completely absurd. Uh, I'm actually saying I love Jim Carrey in this movie. Even though he <sighs> disavows this role. He says it's his least favorite role. He hates this role. We should never do it. <laughs> I think well, it's he, one of he's his like best an anti-vax. Well, you know, yeah, well, you least know, now. that yeah. is what it is. Um, okay, Br- Brian, final, final defense. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I, if I don't you know want to I'll, defend it, you don't have to defend it. <laughs> I, I will defend it. I, th- I think it's. I think yes. it's a good movie. I don't think that it. I don't know why it it exists. Like what? Why is this the story that needs to be told in two thousand one? Um, because it's ultimately. I just don't know what it's trying to say about today, other than movies are important and. You know, <laughs> yeah. Movies rock. I mean, you know. It, very similarly to you know far from heaven uh it's telling us that the world is just fake and and everyone just keeps pretending despite knowing the shitty truth about the world but yet you know aspire to something great and and at least in the case of this movie escape is necessary because the world is so such gar- such garbage mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> i think you know the Martin Landau character um, dying, believing and kind of knowing that Luke is not, you know, who he's supposed to be. Um, it, everybody needs to dream. And I think that idea is very romantic and I get kind of caught up in that. Um, I get caught up in the, the references that are not um, direct references, like just the, the, the character with the, the hook hand, the, the veteran character. I mean, that's very much like yeah, kind yeah. Of best years of our lives. You know, that's right. a, a touching, a touching character um, and a nice little subplot involving him. Um, I don't know. It, it, it works for me, despite me kind of agreeing with all of your, all of your criticism. <laughs> uh, it oh, just, it works for me too. I'm just, <laughs> yeah, that, I, that I mean, is, that really is... enjoy it. I actually really enjoy this. Movie. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, the whole, the whole, you know, boogie woogie, I, wasn't that the music from like Groundhog Day? Like that's such a weird. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's such a weird. Like I don't know if that's a direct nod or if it's just like we're going to use that song. But he, he, there's all this kind of references to other material that I don't, sort of work for me and then sort of don't at times. But yeah, I just get sort of caught up in it, and I think it's. I don't know. I, I'm a sap yeah. sometimes, and I I just yeah. Get, you know, yeah. you know what this. Uh, this movie unfortunately reminded me of was uh, Sam Mendes' movie from last year, Empire of Light. 
Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't see that one. Oh, God. It's it's really bad. Um, Is it really? Oh, I don't. I don't. Yeah. It's But once again, it's it, it's a it's a beautifully shot film. I mean, it's yeah. Deacon's. Uh, but um, similarly, like this, and it also almost feels like a crutch. And maybe maybe I'd be singing the Majestic's praises, uh, you know, um, if I had seen it back when it came out in proper fashion, or even if I had just been like a little, a little more patient, uh, a little older, um, because there are things like you're saying, Brian, about like the importance of that escape, um, that, that do really resonate. And we're pr- probably like one of the reasons other than knowing that it was shot by Deacons that I pressed play on empire of light, because I'm just like, I'm a sucker for that idea of a movie about a movie theater. Um, yeah. And it's just, it, it's also it also might just be like an, an inherently flawed idea because you can't do that without being succumbed to like the temptation to be triacly and uh, sentimental and yeah. romanticize it to an absurd degree. So, um, do you think do you think we would like this movie more if we weren't living in a post nine eleven world? Ooh. That's that's something that kept popping into my head during that really? speech. I was like, <laughs> dude, you can't like that doesn't even I don't know, or also cynical. I mean, think about it. You have nine eleven, you have all the wars, and so you had Bush for freaking whatever it was, eight years. I don't know. And then everything that's happened in the last, you know, five, six years. I think like this movie is probably nails on, on the chalkboard to like younger people i would think right absolutely yeah. i mean yeah i, I could imagine yeah. watching this in 1999 and thinking like what a masterpiece yeah uh, right. and, <laughs> and now watching it it's a little you know it's a little cringy it doesn't quite work and i think we've all become pretty c- cynical since then and i can imagine you know absolutely it bombed in december um oh yeah i mean uh, no one's that's a really good point. Two and a half hour i will say this though <laughs> uh, i think there's a genius movie inside of this film yeah, Somewhere. I want to do a fan edit. Let's do a fan edit. I would do a fan um, edit because you know what you could do, and this is I'm gonna do a quick <laughs> rant. Eliminate all the political stuff completely. <laughs> just let, hear me out. The yeah. movie political stuff completely, and it's just about this guy who watches up on shore and ends up like in, not like impersonating, but becoming this like lost soldier, and then just have it play out from there. But like get rid of the communist stuff. It doesn't. The mm. Hollywood stuff. See, because to me, that's actually fascinating. <laughs> I would is, go the it, opposite direction and say the twist is that the town is actually full of communists. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the the reddest town in California. Yeah, and then we get like a like a red dawn in the 1950s kind of thing happening, <laughs> like an action thing. Okay, I'm cool. With yeah. That. <laughs> oh man, the majestic. Both. Are, I mean, I would say this. Both are like you know, in terms of depictions of the 1950s, are they accurate? I have no idea. But are the interesting <laughs> takes on it? I think so. They're worth seeing both of them. They're not yeah. not something to ignore either of them. I thought they were, you know, I don't think they're accurate by any means. I think they're in a conversation with 1950s cinema. And exactly, so th- yeah. And so they're just depicting what their their individual director's views of what 1950s cinema is. Although, you know, I guess, you know, Capra was kind of out by then. So yes. right. he's referencing 40 cinema, but... Yeah, I, I I thought of that too while watching. It kind of felt like the, it was weird to kind of mix them. So maybe you're right, Dan. Take the politics out of it, and <laughs> uh, then you don't have to worry about the the whole fifty stuff. Um, shall we end this episode with some trivia? Yes, let's do yeah. it. Well, I don't even know what the trivia is. Like, what's the oh, format? Yeah. Okay, I, I thought long and hard about this because I really enjoyed doing it for a last series of episodes in which uh, I either told you a real logline of a movie based on an absurd true story or made one up based on a absurd true story to see if it was a make you think it could either be a true film or a fake film this time since we're talking about set in the 1950s i am going to very simply read from you uh the narration only from a screenplay of a film set in the 1950s (laughs) and see if you can guess it just based on the way that it describes the decade Guess the film. Guess the film. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's go. Go for it. All right. These are all, and since we are doing an episode where it's all, we're, we're focusing on the 2000s cinema vision or version of the 1950s. <laughs> all these films are from that decade. Okay. So okay. from the 2000s, about the 1950s. Okay. Yep. Made in the 2000s, released in the 2000s, but about or set largely or entirely in the 1950s. 
And these are all okay. pretty big movies, so I feel like you'll be able to get it, even though some of the um, uh, narration and slug lines of these uh, screenplays are questionable. Okay. Um, exterior, the Pentagon, Washington, D.C., day 1951. Sun breaks on the monolithic stone building. Interior, the Pentagon, war room. Lit map boards of the Cold War globe, the hulking behemoths of early IBM computers. A young captain stands on a grillwork landing. Reverse, two uniformed technicians, a senior analyst and a general stand before a wall papered with sheets of numbers. <laughs> Any guesses? <laughs> this is going to be ridiculous. Um, I don't know, Brian, you know? I don't know. I have no idea, no. I was going to say uh, like well, 13 days, but that's about the Cuban Missile Crisis, a different decade. Right? Oh, yeah, good guess. Good guess. I'll t- I'll, now I'll tell you the screenwriter, yeah, okay. Akiva Goldsman. Dude. Oh, oh he's wow. buried. Um, I will next reveal the, the director, uh, the director, Ron Howard. Yeah. Oh, Paul. Wait, no. This is from, from the 2000s. We're yep. so bad at this. We're 2001. So Wait, Beautiful Mind? There you go. Oh, Wait, yeah, what? Sure. How does that start in the <laughs> Pentagon? <laughs> you know what? No, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I skipped the stuff of him in college because that's in the okay. 40s. And then it, uh, gotcha, the first, gotcha, gotcha. that's the first okay. scene of the film in the 1950s when we fast forward and now he's, <laughs> he's like working for the, this is going to be he's, tough, man. This is yeah. Be tough. Yeah. It's a very strange script. I, I have not seen that movie in forever. Also a masterpiece. I, <laughs> okay, no, come know. on. Okay. I, I only saw that movie once and I just like deleted it from my mind. Yeah. This, uh, okay. I kind of liked it. I kinda liked no, it. come on, Dan. You know, okay. I'm a sucker, <laughs> All right. It, if you say that about this one, I will be concerned. Okay, we got. Uh, so same thing. Movie starts. Mm-hmm. It, this is a movie that goes back and forth between several decades, but largely sure. takes place in the fifties. Okay. Um, uh, exterior, Moscow Street, night, nineteen fifty-two, and we see Daisy, five years older, her arm inside a tall, young, blonde Russian dancer's Anatoly, crossing a snowy street in Moscow. Interior, <sighs> Moscow apartment, night fifty-two. Daisy in bed, the young Russian dancer Anatoly lying beside her asleep. Daisy looking off. No guesses Jeez. yet. Jeez, you're gonna get it with War? this next one. Uh, it, it came in. The, the, I don't know. Go for it. No yeah. guess. Yeah. Interior: Benjamin's room, Nolan House, night 1952. We see Benjamin in bed, turning off the light. Oh, curious case of Benjamin. <laughs> Bunn. There yeah. we go. I've actually never seen that. <laughs> Wait, really? No, oh my gosh! I refuse I'm, to. I'm not going to. Y- no, really? it's a. <laughs> i refuse i i love david fincher too. i just can't do it <laughs> it's, I, I, it's remember, a, I haven't watched it's a, it for maybe 15 years but i remember really liking it but I did you like it really? <sighs> Man, i don't know it just seems I, a little much for me i did not but uh no. it's it is pretty to look at so uh, yeah okay anyways next one uh interior chicago theater October 15, 1958, the Radio and Television News Directors Association Annual Meeting. We're in the wings of the theater. Standing there alone is... I'm going to skip the name of the character because I would give it away. He looks yeah. slightly ill at ease. He lights a cigarette. He looks at some notes in his hand as we overhear his glowing introduction by the MC. Cheers and applause as we walk with him to the podium. Oh, a I long, know. awkward pause. Go, Brian. Oh, is it good night? Go good it. luck? Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's nice one. That almost yeah. was on our list for the movies, but I just thought, I don't know. It's a little on the nose. Uh, a little on the nose. I do yeah. love the film, though. Yeah. Uh, interior does a uh, four out of five. So okay. two more. Interior tram day, December 1958. Michael, now 15, is sitting on a tram. He is in a well cut suit he's inherited, ill fitting with two toned shoes and a tangled mop of hair. Sweat breaks out all over his face. A woman is staring at him. He's fe- plainly feeling ill. Interior Michael's apartment day, night. Uh, this is now fast forward to 95. Michael stands at the window looking out. Interior tram day, 1958. Flashback. Impulsively, <sighs> Michael gets up, rings the bell, and gets off at the next stop. Uh, wow. The reader? Yeah, good one, Dan. Wow. Yeah, wow. I, that was going to be my toughie for the for the round. Well, that came um, up a lot on the list. Like, I almost picked that it. movie like 10 times. I was <laughs> oh, like, the reader? Uh, maybe. No. That's a movie, like really? Brian said, where I watched it and deleted no, it from my brain. No, that right. was okay. <laughs> There's a lot going on in that movie. Yeah, I remember uh, liking there? it. I just haven't thought about it since <laughs> I watched it. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, this one I will be surprised if Dan doesn't get right away. Title up Western Kansas, 1959. Exterior farmhouse morning. 
The camera follows a 16-year-old girl, long hair, pretty Sunday church dress, walking toward a peaceful farmhouse. At the door, she lifts the knocker. The door opens slightly. The girl turns and looks past the camera as her, at her mother, sitting in an old Plymouth idling in the driveway. Her mother shrugs, motions for her to go inside. Interior, farmhouse, continuous. The girl walks through the downstairs rooms. In the kitchen, the phone is off the hook. The girl looks back toward the open front door. She turns toward the stairs, climbs them. Interior farmhouse, upstairs hall, continuous. She walks down the hall to a bedroom door at the end. The door is slightly ajar. She knocks, then enters the room. Interior farmhouse, bedroom, continuous. The girl's POV. The camera pans across the bedroom of a high school co-ed. We see the desk, the bureau, the bed. On the bed lies Nancy Clutter. Is that in cold blood? Nope. Remember, made in the 2000s? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was like blanked. Me in the two thousand. Oh my god, Capote. Yeah, there you go. Oh <laughs> god, okay. I was so confused. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm glad I could uh, uh, tease That's your good. brains. Those a are tough. Bit, guys. Those yeah, are a those lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Oof. Love okay, it. I'll, I'll 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 do my best to bring the difficulty level down a little bit next time. Um, um, what do we got coming up, man? Oh, Brian, what do you got going on? What's uh, going on? Yeah, yeah. Going to be on the news anytime soon? Uh, yeah, 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 um, yeah. That's kind of a weird, uh, weird development that uh, is happening. I don't really, uh, I don't know that I enjoy being on television. Yeah, I was going to ask you how that is, <laughs> like being with the reporters and stuff, and kind of talking about movies. I'm uh, is it like nerve wracking. Oh god, I'm an anxious person. Just you know, on this conversation, I'm super anxious. It's, it's just awkward. yeah, yeah. Any kind of human interaction is, makes me go crazy so uh, <laughs> being there is like i feel like an idiot and i feel like i can't even watch myself it's it's terrible but hey i'm yeah. doing it so uh there we it's go it's really cool man thanks yeah, really definitely. Awesome. thanks yeah. um yeah i'm gonna be on again on i think the saturday the 8th um i'm not sure if this podcast will be out by then but um potentially potentially but you can yeah you can search Kara Levin and Brian Eggert and you'll find a whole bunch of videos that I've done for them. Um, Sweet. Otherwise, this summer I'm kind of doing a series on uh, Steven Soderbergh for my Patreon. Nice. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, to tie this back to Far From Heaven, that film was produced by Section 8. Um, yes. And Section 8 is such an awesome little company that doesn't exist anymore. They made uh, just a ton of really good movies in the in the 2000s. Um, little movies that would never get made with a normal studio that really championed like great filmmakers like Todd Haynes and Richard Linklater and um, several others. But uh, I'd recommend like looking at what Section 8 produced and, and uh, checking it out because their, their track record is pretty great. Um, Very cool. So besides that, yeah, I'm just uh, keeping up with all the new releases, writing a few um, big essays about like Cleo from five to seven. And uh, mm. that one's coming out this week and later in the summer, uh, Paris, Texas. Nice. Uh, yeah. So that's where I'm at. Very cool. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. And then Chris, what do we got coming up? We got what LA Confidential and the, this boy's life, I think. Yes, I'm uh, very interested to, to revisit both of those movies. Have you seen This Boy's Life before? I have not. No. Oh, yeah. But LA okay. Confidential is one of my favorite movies. So uh, Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, we'll you see and your Russell Crowe, man. Um, uh, love him. He's great. <laughs> he is great. I saw Pope's Exorcist. Phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. This has been Film Trace. <laughs>